Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tia Shimada. I'm the Director of Programs with Nourish California. I'll be moderating the listening session today. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be here. To join the session in Spanish, please click interpretation in your webinar control, then click Spanish to access Spanish translation or interpretation, excuse me. And Shaleen, if you could please share those same instructions in Spanish, thank you. And Shaleen, I think you're muted. If you can unmute yourself, or maybe there is a, a technical issue that we're running into. Okay. And if we're not able to have Shaleen share those instructions in Spanish, then we can also share them in the chat box as well. So a few logistics before we go any further. If you're so inclined, please edit your screen name to share any organizational affiliations or roles as well as your preferred pronouns. Every attendee is joining us with a muted microphone today, but later in the session, your microphone could be unmuted if you decide to provide a verbal comment. And after today's session, we'll be sharing a recording of this whole entire event. Just give me one second. I'm sorry, thank you. My, my mouse, my, my keyboard mouse and my side mouse are fighting with each other for control, but I think we figured out who won. <laughs> so again, these are instructions um, and just covering some logistics before we dive in any further. And we also have someone staffing the chat box today. So if you have any questions um, in terms of the platform or logistics for the webinar, please do insert those in the chat and our staff can be um, sure to try to assist you. We are so grateful to have individuals and organizations from across California in the virtual room with us today. That inclusive reach is due to the many partners who joined together to make this event possible. We wanna share our appreciation for the California Association of Food Banks, the Children's Partnership, Children Now, the Partnership for Children and Youth, the Child and Adult Care Food Program Roundtable, No Kid Hungry, and the California WIC Association. I also want to take just a moment to acknowledge one of our stellar Nourish California team members, Melissa Cannon. It was her time and energy and effort that made this session possible. So a big thank you to, to Melissa. Also a big thank you to everyone who submitted questions and comments in advance of today's session. Your input has been shared with USDA and Deputy Undersecretary Dean is going to do her best to address your input throughout her time with us today. Of course, I also want to extend our deep appreciation to the under Deputy Undersecretary for being with, with us today. This session is an opportunity for all of us to share our priorities and concerns directly with the Biden administration. We want to understand what changes are needed to strengthen WIC and the child nutrition programs for California families. What's working well about the, with these programs in your communities and what's not working well and why? The Deputy Undersecretary isn't in a position today to resolve issues in real time with us. She is here to make sure that California voices, the California perspective, and California priorities do get heard by her fellow decision makers in Washington, D.C. This is just a quick overview of where we're headed from now until 1.30. Um, I'll be wrapping up this welcome and introductions in just a couple of minutes. And then we'll hear remarks from Deputy Undersecretary Dean. We'll spend the rest of our time together hearing your comments. In the spirit of providing a platform for as many as people as possible today, please do feel free to submit written comments in the chat box as well. We'll share a transcript of the chat box with the USDA team after the session is over. And now I am privileged to introduce Deputy Undersecretary Stacey Dean. Ms. Dean was appointed by President Biden to serve as the Deputy Undersecretary for USDA's Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services, where she works to advance the President's agenda 
on increasing nutrition assistance for struggling families and individuals, as well as tackling systemic racism and barriers to opportunity that have denied so many the chance to get ahead. Prior to joining President Biden's team at USDA, Ms. Dean served as the Vice President for Food Assistance Policy at the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, or CBPP. She directed CBPP's food assistance team, which published frequent reports on the federal nutrition programs and how they affect families and communities, as well as developing policies to improve them. In addition to her work on federal nutrition programs, Ms. Dean directed CBPP's efforts to integrate the Delivered Health and Human Services programs at the state and local level. Before joining CBPP, she worked as a budget analyst at the Office of Management and Budget. And I think I hit all of those acronyms correctly, um, but I'll ask your forgiveness if I didn't. Deputy Undersecretary, we are so appreciative of you being here with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I'm gonna ask you to take it away. Well, thank you so much, Tia. Uh, first of all, um, I, I have been a, a long partner, friend and ally of Nourish California Sport, like at this point, decades. So uh, I was Stacy and I remain Stacy. So please just uh, feel free to dispense with the title. Uh, and I'm also, thanks so much for using that photo. I look so much younger and uh, vital there, but uh, COVID, <laughs> COVID has aged many of us. Um, anyway, good afternoon, everybody. It's just really great to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with uh, all of you today, this uh, wonderful California audience, and more importantly, to hear from you about maximizing the reach of WIC and the child nutrition programs in California. Um, I really want to thank Nourish California for hosting this event, along with all of their partners, uh, who many of whom are uh, old friends. Um, Nourish California is a wonderful California institution in the any hunger space, uh, very old friends from my former job and I appreciate them even more today we're in my new role where uh, we just need to be hearing from. Uh, uh, smart caring voices about what's needed. Uh, and it's just wonderful to be among advocates uh, like all of the folks on on this uh, platform today. You do amazing work to ensure that everyone in California has enough to eat. And that's just inspiring and energizing uh, to be with. So thank you. So I'm grateful to have the chance to spend some time with you uh, and to hear from you about how the pandemic uh, and other issues are affecting families in California and how it's impacting your work and my work now. Uh, I'm really hoping to hear from you about the things you're doing to improve food insecurity as we think about moving towards a post-COVID future. And I'm also looking forward to sharing an overview of some of our core plans to address the profound personal struggles so many Americans are facing today as a result of the COVID-19 health crisis. The president's approach is both about addressing the immediate needs of today and paving a path to an economic recovery that's more equitable and just for all Americans, regardless of their background. So let's get to it. Um, one thing is certain that the COVID-19 public health and economic crisis is really bigger than any other that we've seen in our lifetimes, leaving millions of families around the country struggling to afford food and keep a roof overhead. And now that crisis of food insecurity is particularly urgent amongst communities of color who've been disproportionately impacted from hunger. This was true before the pandemic and made much worse during the pandemic. The most recent data shows that I think one in six black and Latino adults report not having enough food to eat compared to one in 16 white adults. Uh, just that an extraordinary disparity. Congress has passed um, several important relief bills, I'm sure that many of you are expert on, that have helped the nation start to heal. And it also with respect to hunger and hardship, things are getting better on that front. But more needs to be done to help the uh, many Americans who are barely hanging on. And it's just really not gonna be enough to return to where we were before the pandemic. We wanna set our sights on a brighter tomorrow stronger, better equipped, more equitable nation. And that uh, certainly, if nothing else, begins with uh, a nation where there is no hunger. So we have to build back up. So let's start with um, um, how we think we can maximize the impact of WIC in this plan. Um, so uh, WIC is really uh, all about families with young children. And from day one, ensuring that Americans' children get the nourishment that they need despite the pandemic uh, and, and long beyond is, been a, is really a truly a top priority of the administration. 
Um, so one of the first things we can do is to expand the reach of WIC. Uh, and, and it's good reason that we wanna start there. Um, the nutrition provided by this program is vital to the health and well-being of low-income mothers and their children, ensuring that they have the personalized nutrition resources and health referrals that they need. As many of you likely know, WIC has proven to have incredibly positive impacts for at the at-risk women and children who participate. And um, what those are, are WIC participants are more likely to have a more nutritious diet and better health outcomes. And there's strong evidence that WIC participation results in fewer infant deaths, fewer premature births, increased birth weights, and reduced healthcare costs, which is just uh, uh, an extraordinary outcome. However, nationally, WIC participation has been on the decline. It was before the pandemic, and that continued, even as hunger rates soared uh, during COVID. So while participation increased slightly at the beginning of the pandemic, participation for federal fiscal year 2021 has remained lower than in previous years, despite, despite the fact that data shows many as 14 million children may not always have had access to enough nutritious food. So this is a very disappointing trend, and we're committed to reaching more of those who are eligible for the program and connecting them with the program's valuable benefits. Now, uh, this trend I just described is not what's been happening in California. California actually boosted work participation in the state over its pre-pandemic level. Despite a sharp dip in 2020, WIC participation in the Golden State has rebounded, growing by nearly 24,000 uh, between 19 and now. 2019, sorry. So uh, you're reaching and enrolling more, more eligibles. Uh, in California, 33% of all women and children who are eligible for WICS vital services are not participating. That's significantly lower than the 40% national average. So I think this is incredibly encouraging and commend all of you for working on it. But I challenge, and I challenge you to keep going, right? Keep reaching out to WIC eligibles and keeping them connected. And of course, uh, that means we have a lot to learn from you about what's working and what kinds of innovations you've brought to the program that have made it so successful in California. Um, now, the part of the reason we need to do this is because it's just a vitally important program, but it's also true that the American Rescue Plan uh, of 2021 included a historic investment in WIC and WIC farmers markets, which USDA is going to use to improve program delivery uh, and increase participation uh, among eligible women and children. So FNS is currently developing a plan for investing uh, $390 million that was allocated to us for this purpose. And we wanna use data-driven strategies and stakeholder feedback to increase the program's reach. So we know this effort will include an, a robust national outreach plan uh, campaign to ensure that eligible families know about the program's benefits and it'll also encourage innovation to in, improve service delivery, streamline benefit delivery, and increase the use of benefits. Um, now, the American Rescue Plan also provided $490 million to help with participants purchase healthy foods during this difficult time. And we're using these funds uh, to help state to allow state agencies to temporarily increase the cash value voucher for purchasing fruits and vegetables for up to four months. So uh, we're hoping that. Um, that increased benefit will also encourage uh, more eligible families to apply and stay connected with the program. So that'll help give us a boost as we move forward. You know, this temporary increase triples the um, benefit amount for fruits and vegetables and helps also fulfill the administration's commitment to combat both food insecurity and nutrition insecurity uh, during crisis, making healthy food more accessible and affordable for everyone. So that's some of our work on WIC, and I can't wait to hear from folks uh, on, the, on the Zoom call on uh, your thoughts about the program. So let me turn to school meals and COVID recovery. You know, WIC reaches our nation's youngest children, but our child nutrition programs are also critical to ensuring access to nutritious meals as children grow. And we're really trying to take vigorous action to help, help kids during the COVID pandemic uh, through the school meals program. So at the beginning of the pandemic, you all know USDA provided broad flexibilities that allowed schools to provide meals to all children free of charge while following local and federal health guidelines. And we're continuing to provide that flexibility through the next school year to support schools as they reopen so that they can ensure that they can safely provide children nationwide with healthy school meals and yet have the flexibility to adapt to what's likely to be uncertain and like um, possibly changing circumstances. 
Now, in addition to school meals flexibility, we also have the pandemic EBT program. Over the last year, you may have heard about it, uh, PEBT. It operates a lot like um, SNAP or uh, CalFresh, where nutrition benefits are loaded onto an EBT card that's used to purchase food. But this program is specifically designed to ensure that children are getting adequate nutrition when they're out of school. Uh, you know, it was provided to provide the food benefits to kids in financially stressed households where they were missing meals because they that they would have normally received in school but couldn't because of COVID closures. And we've recently approved California's plan for children missing out on either childcare and school meals for this school year, school year 2021. And I'm sorry to say it's been this late because of course it's June, the school year is uh, basically over for most kids. But under this plan, California expects to provide $5.3 billion to families covering um, who have 5 million children in them. And that'll be happening later this summer into the early fall. So that, and that payment is essentially retroactive, meaning to cover the prior school year. That's an extraordinary investment in um, addressing hunger and need in the state. And I, I really look forward to hearing about how it's working. So PEBT will be, um, also available for the summer months, uh, for this summer. Uh, for this summer alone, we expect that across the country, families of over 30 million children will receive about $375 per child to help pay for uh, cover food costs during the summer months. We really wanna see California submit a plan. I'm sure they will. Uh, and with the boost from folks on this call, uh, I'm sure it'll be a, a terrific effort. So, uh, you know, a full and equitable recovery from COVID isn't possible without our children being fed. And that's why programs like PEBT, School Meals, and WIC is just really critical and uh, was um, basically some of the programs that we and initiatives we wanted to focus on really coming out of the blocks in the first days and weeks of the administration. So looking ahead to beyond COVID-19, uh, we know that children will still need to access nutritious, healthy meals. Uh, um, even in the best of times, we have too many Americans struggling to afford to put food on the table. And unfortunately, that includes children. But I um, also want to flag that in addition to helping families meet those basic needs, that the school meals program, recent research shows that uh, kids receive their healthiest meals uh, of the day at school. We know we are really doing uh, an important job in investing kids' basic health by creating strong child nutrition programs and a healthy, healthy food environment at school. It's just especially vital for low-income children who rely on these meals as the, their main source of nutrition. Um, and of course, we wanna make sure that school meals remain accessible to as many vulnerable children as possible. Um, USDA already has a proven strategy for doing that. It's called the Community Eligibility Provision, which California makes great use of. And years ago, uh, Nourish California, back when it was CFPA, was uh, part of a statewide group that helped really push and lead the way on uh, making sure um, that uh, the state took advantage of that option. And under that option, uh, it allows high poverty schools, schools measured by, as measured by the share of children enrolled in uh, CalFresh or in California uh, Medi-Cal, uh, to be auto-enrolled into uh, free and reduced price meals, but and then just sort of taking that measure of kids as a proxy measure for um, how many in the school are uh, eligible for free and reduced price meals. And it basically, there's a mechanism to go universal free in these high poverty schools. We're looking to expand that option to make it so that it's available to more schools uh, who are still very high poverty, but don't quite meet the uh, eligibility rules that are currently there. Uh, and the administration is propo proposing to invest $17 billion to expand that option um, with a particular focus on elementary schools. We estimate that CE with, under this proposal, CEP participation would uh, substantially increase. And we think that basically we'd be covering about half the kids in the country and half the schools, a little bit higher and lower on either side of 50% for each one. I think that's both, that's that's an extraordinary provision and something to be celebrated, and I hope we see Congress enact. It's also you know, a commentary on the share of how kids who are uh, struggling with low incomes and attending schools where the majority of children are very low income. And so we feel like this investment there is both important for kids and the schools. I also want to spend a second, and I'm sorry I'm rattling on on all of these priorities, but just it gives you a sense of 
Uh, we're only been in for a few months. I'm the only policy official in the food and nutrition area, and yet we are rolling along because uh, for President Biden and Secretary Vilsack, uh, making sure that Americans have enough food to eat is important, but also that their nutrition security is critical. So um, uh, with a focus on children in particular, you know, nutrition science uh, and sound data have underpinned nutrition assistance programs for decades, and they, um, they're going to continue to guide our agency's efforts. We really want to make sure that families have not only the um, resources, but the skills, motivation, and access to make food choices that promote better health and brighter futures. So you'll see in our budget, we're, um, we want to continue the investment in uh, fruit and vegetable vouchers in WIC. We are looking to launch a healthy food incentive pilot in schools where we give higher, richer reimbursements to districts that are adopting healthy practices. Um, we want to uh, plus up funding for SNAP nutrition education uh, so that, and, and do better on supporting evidence-based interventions um, there. Uh, increase nutrition education uh, in our uh, tribal uh, food program. And of course, do all the work we need to do to update the nutrition standards in uh, our child nutrition and WIC programs based on the new dietary guidelines. So just want to make sure everyone understands this is also about um, making sure that we have a strong and sound nutrition orientation to all that we do. Um, so let me stop there and thank you all for letting me share some of our uh, priorities and USD's deep commitment to helping America build back better maximizing the reach and impact of WIC and other USDA assistance programs. Uh, we know that our federal programs accomplish incredible good, but we are striving for even more impact with our programs and our actions. And that begins by listening to you about what will make the most difference. Um, we count on our partners to help us understand the challenges faced by the people and communities that you serve. Uh, we need to remove barriers to accessing our programs uh, to ensure that children and families have access to safe and healthy food. We want to do that with an equity lens uh, to make sure that we are identifying particular barriers, barriers from an equity uh, perspective and that our solutions um, are seeking to uh, reduce the gaps in uh, food, the, the, who is experiencing uh, food insecurity and why they're experiencing food insecurity. That is also part of our mission. So my door is open for your feedback, um, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts during this listening session and, and being in touch moving forward. So with that, Tia, I'm going to stop and uh, turn it back over to you. All right. Stacey, thank you so much um, for those thoughts and those insights. Also, thank you for the reprieve on the title. It was just, I, no one needs to see me tripping over um, this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> It's quite and a mouthful, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, apologies to all of you who were um, trying your best to, to uh, edit your screen name. I promise we weren't trying to, to test if you were paying attention. We thought that would be an option, and it turns out that it isn't with this platform. So apologies for any of you who are running in circles about that. Um, in just a moment, we are going to open up the virtual floor for your public comments. Want to share again that this is a fantastic opportunity for all of you to share your your priorities, your experiences, your ideas directly with Stacy and the Biden administration. Um, Stacy isn't in a position today to settle uh, specific issues and and resolve specific issues with us, um, but she is here as a, a tremendously important conduit to other policymakers in D.C. And we are all here to lift up your input. Um, so thank you all for, for being here and for being so willing um, to share your thoughts with us. From the infrastructure package to child nutrition reauthorization, reauthorization, we are heading toward really critical opportunities to influence federal policies that are going to shape WIC, the child nutrition programs, um, and affect the families that they serve. We encourage you all with us today to share your thoughts on the changes that you think are necessary to strengthen WIC and the child nutrition programs um, to make those programs as, as good as they can to serve as many families as we can um, to reach all the eligible folks in California. Um, we wanna understand, and Stacey and her team wanna understand what's working well, what isn't working well, what changes do you wanna see? Before we do hear our first comment, I also want to acknowledge that Jesus Mendoza, the Western Regional Administrator for the USDA Food and Nutrition Service is also here with us today. 
Um, in addition to Stacey, Jesus and his team are going to be listening to all of your comments today. And Jesus, I just want to take a moment to see if you'd like to introduce yourself to everyone who's gathered here. Good afternoon, Tia, and thank you for inviting me to today's listening session. It's a pleasure to be here and listen to everyone's comments. And thank you, Stacy, for the great overview that you provided. Uh, like Tia mentioned, we will have our staff here listening to some of the comments. And if there's any follow up, we will follow up and then uh, provide an appropriate response. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jesus Mendoza and I'm the Regional Administrator for the USDA FNS Western Regional Office located in San Francisco. Me, myself and my staff, we look forward to listen to the comments that will be provided today. So again, thank you for inviting us and we look forward to the comments. Thank you, Tia. Good to see you, Jesus. Thanks, Thanks. for being here. Hey, Sue, thanks to you and your team for being here. We, we do appreciate it. Uh, all right. So uh, we would like to invite your comments. Uh, please feel free to comment in Spanish or English. I'm just going to walk through a couple of instructions here uh, to make sure that this all runs as smoothly as it can. If you'd like to share a verbal comment, please click raise hand um, from the participant drop down menu. Or if you're taking uh, joining the audio by phone, you can press star nine. And doing either of those, of those things will put you in the queue for verbal comments. When it's your turn to speak, a staff member is going to identify you by name or the last four digits of your phone number, and then you'll have the option to unmute your microphone. We do ask that you keep your comments to three minutes or less today, simply to give as many people as possible the opportunity to be heard. And you're also absolutely invited to share written comments via the chat box. We ask if you do that, that you select the option to share with all panelists and attendees. All right, and with that, um, the floor is open for public comment and Melissa is uh, doing her due diligence in the background to make sure that um, we can hear whatever you all want to share. Excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Tracy Weatherby, uh, well, you will be first. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Stacy. it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Tracy Weatherby. I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Advocacy for Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. And we're one of the largest Feeding America food banks, and we're currently serving 500,000 people per month. Um, we have 35 school districts here in Silicon Valley, and child hunger is a main focus, focus for our food bank. And we've been so appreciative of everything the USDA has done to ensure that all children could get school and summer meals during the pandemic. And we're really excited about the increased coverage of CEP. But we also believe that this has really highlighted that the real long-term answer is school meals for all. It ensures health and equity and it's an investment we need to make now to ensure that every child is ready to learn and thrive. A lot of the families in our communities are really afraid to apply for school meals. And also a lot don't qualify because the cost of living is sky high here. So the, there are a lot of people struggling way above 185%. So, you know, we don't think we should be dividing kids into free, reduced and paid children. Um, school meals for all is an important tool to really build community in this divided country. And we'd love to see School Meals for All addressed through the American Families Plan. So keep it coming if you can. Thank you so much. And Karan. Hi, Stacy. I've known you and followed you over the years with uh, CBPP, with Zoe, and previously with Stephen Harvey, who I'm still in touch with, by the way. She always sends you such loving regards. You know, I, I know we have the administration support with the WIC program. I'm a WIC program local agency director in LA. I also put a comment in about not being competitive about how we advertise because our, our families look at it as, you know, I'd rather do this and go to WIC because WIC, I have to only buy these foods. We really got to sell WIC as the premier public health nutrition program. And there's a reason for the prescriptive food. If we can get the families to make healthy choices, how do we kind of then work with Use your yard fresh to buy the same healthy foods for the rest of your family members because this is just for the people in the family. And beyond that, use it to buy the meat. Use it to buy the, you know, the stuff that Rick doesn't give. We've got to be able to market all of our programs to our families in a way that 
as you said, there was a reason they weren't coming back to WIC because after age one, you know, they don't want to jump through hoops. And I know you're on our side when I'm saying this, that we really need to keep these waivers in place. It's like a dam, you know, we've kind of let the floodgates open. And if we try and dam things back and we build a big dam and we bring back the, you know, presence at CERT and all those difficult things that made it hard for a family to fully participate in the WIC program, it's going to slow down to a trickle and we'll be responsible for that. So I, I know you're on our side with the fresh fruits and vegetables. I do, believe it or not, I just did a webinar about an hour ago when I've told everybody, spend it. It's like, you know, get it, spend it so we can keep it and tell your Congress people about how great it is because I know you need our support with that. But please keep the waivers in place. Please keep the fruits and vegetables in place. We've got to keep our families going. And if a review of the food package, the sooner we can do it and we can really make the food package substantial, the National Book Association recommendations, I know you work really closely with them. All I can say is we are delighted to have such great people in the White House and at USDA, and thank God for that. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I mean, I will. I just want to say, I think WIC is sort of the best program that eligibles don't know about, right? So um, in a way, we've got uh, an easy job with outreach because we are selling such an extraordinary uh, service and with such strong outcomes. Um, I do think retention, just as you pointed out, retention is going to be really important, right? We, we do a really good job at reaching pregnant and women and infants. And so instead of just thinking about outreach, we want to think about how to keep those families connected. So I hope to hear from others about that. And um, you, I think you're right. We, right? We, we basically COVID generated a modernization, like it could have been a five-year modernization effort happened in the short span of months. So what we've got to figure out is which of the waivers and, and the way that they were implemented really worked. Um, and so uh, we're actually in the process of doing, um, we have a, a Congress mandated an assessment on that and we're in the throes of doing it, um, but also want to hear from states and local, uh, local counties or service providers it's not just having them, right? Some, because many states took exactly the same waivers and in some states, the caseload went down and in some cases it went up. So just trying to figure all of that out real time with you uh, so we know what to bring forward. So, so thanks. Great, and we'll go ahead and head to Benjamin Chow. Hi, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Awesome, hi Stacy. Uh, my name is Benjamin Chow, I'm a, I'm at the uh, California Immigrant Policy Center, and part of my work, we um, we lead a coalition called the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition that is working to improve uh, immigrant benefit access to programs like WIC, um, and you know, like um, and and food assistance programs that help families and children. Um, one of the key issues over the past four years, as you may know, was the, the 2019 public charge rule and other anti-immigrant policies that have damaged the trust that immigrants and their families have with not just federal agencies and programs, but state and local government agencies as well. Um, and of course, with the new administration, that rule has been reversed and we're slowly trying to undo that and continue rebuilding trust. So my question, it's more of a question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts is, um, how does USDA plan to rebuild trust and promote enrollment of immigrants in nutrition assistance programs like WIC, um, like pandemic EBT, considering that the eligibility guidelines have allowed uh, many un uh, uh, undocumented youth to actually to access the program as well. Um, but unfortunately, uh, with the school age uh, program as it stands now, um, undocumented children will not qualify because of CalFresh um, or Medicaid um, enrollment uh, requirements. Um, so how does the department think through immigrant inclusion and access for programs like Pandemic UET and others? So just want to, so we don't have, there's no immigrant eligibility screen for um, school meals. So just want to make sure everybody, we don't have confusion about that. The direct certification can write the passporting through from other programs only benefits. Oh, um, right, those who qualify. I misspoke, I meant uh, childcare aged children. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Um, but I just, <laughs> I don't want there to be any confusion there. Um, I think, you know, you, you, I think you said it best, which is trust has been broken, right? It's not about a specific policy. Well, it is about the accumulation of individual policies, but changing public charge, changing the confidence that we can give folks that they um, inter around 
uh, deportation or reporting worries uh, are important steps, but trust is something that is, uh, I think, more fragile and fundamental than that. So actually, just earlier this afternoon, I was on uh, a call with all of the program heads across FNS working on uh, to having a conversation about what can we do. Um, so, you know, creating a place on our website where we can uh, pull together all of the information about eligibility and uh, reassurance, uh, that would be one thing. Obviously showing up to do lots of training. Uh, I've, I've reached out to regional administrators like Jesus and his peers uh, to say, I think it's really important that you are listening to communities. We, what we don't wanna do is come forward and say, hey, you can trust us now. Here's what we're doing to prove that you can trust. What we need to do is start with, why don't you trust us? What are you concerned about? And listen, right? Uh, and think, what can we do to restore confidence there? So uh, I view this as a, a mar that one, this one's a marathon, not a sprint, uh, and really want to work with people like you and your peers around the country to uh, figure out where the cracks, the fissures, the gaps exist so that we, uh, I, I just think fundamentally people have, if, if, our, if, our, if our neighbors don't have confidence in government, then we're just not doing things right. So we have a lot of work to do and, and we're going to get to it. Thank you. And we'll go ahead and head to Heidi McHugh. Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. Uh, we really appreciate the administration's proposal about summer EBT, but we are wondering if you have also considered um, a summer EBT type program specifically to address disasters like wildfires and COVID-19, in which in those situations, families are often dispersed. They're not in their communities, oftentimes in other counties or states, and it's really difficult to uh, feed children at sites. Um. I'm not sure. So I guess uh, maybe a different way of saying it is I think we, we think COVID, one of the learnings from COVID is we need disaster authority in WIC and school meals um, that isn't just about uh, congregate meal provision. So what you're describing, I think, would be uh, one possible way to interpret doing it. So yes, it's definitely top of mind that we don't want to be in a position where we have to wait for Congress to act when we experience something so devastating. Thank you. Yeah, and, and again, welcome your ideas on that. So thanks. Great, thank you. And we'll go ahead and head to Amanda Macia. Hi, my name is Amanda Macia. Thank you for this opportunity. I am the Hunger Free Kids Manager at the San Diego Hunger Coalition. I want to further advocate for the other voices on this call for school meals for all. We are, of course, firmly behind all children being fed at school. And if we can't reach that objective immediately, we would love to see the CEP multiplier. Um, but we would also love to see the CEP multiplier increase with parity for both elementary and, um, and high school students as well. We know that high school students experiencing hunger are 20% more likely to drop out of school. So they too deserve to be fed at, um, as much as our elementary school students. And we are also firmly in support of a permanent EBT program. Um, the last speaker was talking about summers and closures. We're full support of that um, the, in, with the Stop How Child Hunger Act that's currently out. But we really want to talk about the continued flexibilities. Um, some of those waivers have been just tremendously helpful in San Diego County and across California. So the non-congregate waivers have been so helpful, especially in the summer. And we also want to to make sure that we advocate um, specifically for bulk meal flexibility. Bulk meals have been one of the key drivers of meal participation in San Diego County among our districts. Districts that have enacted bulk meal participation have seen 50% meal participation at their pickup sites. Families desperately need the bulk meal flexibility to continue in the upcoming school year that's expected to expire. Um, our San Diego County Office of Ed has um, spoken out and saying that our districts need to be able to work towards having at least one grab and go site throughout the upcoming school year so that any kids that are sent home in quarantine 
or continue to distance learn, have access to at least one grab and go site a week, and bulk meal flexibility is key to making sure families can access healthy and nutritious meals. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> So I, just two things out there, that was a lot. So let me just <laughs> react to um, two quick things. So one is I definitely hope that um, it may not be directly responsive to what you're asking is, but we do hope that California uh, will get guidance out, but that California submits a PEBT proposal for next year that will be more real time um, in the case, right? As opposed, and. And I'm not picking on California, right? That there were five, I think there were four or five law changes to PEBT. That program was just unfolding uh, and was very difficult for states to get going um, until actually the Biden administration came in. But moving, looking ahead to next year, I think we do hope that that is set up early and much more responsive to individual circumstances. Um, and of course, when there is a disaster like that, summer can pivot in. So so that's one one. Um, one issue. And on the universal point, since you're the third person to flag it, I mean, I think uh, I, I appreciate the enthusiasm for universal. The families plan, as you pointed out, which is where the, the, what the administration is supporting uh, in this particular context would get us half the way there. Um, and um, so I think it would, and, and focusing on high poverty schools. And bear in mind, uh, in most cases, many uh, the, the reimbursement rate rate for elementary schools will, uh, it's a weighted average. So it's, the, the, I, I think about this really as having a huge impact on districts. So a lot of those high schools that folks are concerned about will absolutely come in. Um, so, it, but it's not, it doesn't get all the way there. So I understand that, but uh, the idea of having half the schools and half the kids in the country in, uh, I think is an extraordinary advancement towards where folks wanna go. And I, you know, I suspect the, the, as the negotiation process goes on, the family's plan isn't gonna get bigger. So um, uh, it's important. I, were, I wanna make sure that Congress hears that advancing this coverage is important so that as the package gets smaller, um, we, don't, we aren't dropping out. That's just one thing I'd flag. Thank you. And Eli Zegas, you are next. Great. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Stacy, my name is Eli Zegas. I think we've corresponded. I don't think we've met. I'm with uh, Spur and uh, really appreciate you being here. Wanted to raise something that overlaps with the child nutrition programs, but in a slightly different way. So pandemic EBT and CalFresh dollars go to families, many of whom have kids. Um, and as I think you know, there are a number of incentive programs, healthy food incentive programs operating in California and across the country. Um, and those incentive dollars, when a CalFresh family buys produce, they get bonus dollars to, to allow them to buy more produce at farmers markets or grocery stores. Uh, the program we run in Santa Clara County and Alameda County, as well as other programs supported by GUSNIP, the, the funding from the Farm Bill. Um, and in California, we are looking to scale this statewide eventually and worked with Nourish on legislation in 2018 to follow in the footsteps of Massachusetts, the USDA sponsored pilot in 2012. And I wanted to raise an issue with you that um, the model we settled on here in California, which is you earn on California grown fresh fruits and vegetables, the bonus dollars that the families get to spend going back onto their EBT card can be spent on anything SNAP eligible. Um, so provides a lot of flexibility is exactly the same model that was used in Massachusetts. In the most recent RFA that USDA put out uh, for GUSNIP, that program design of earning on produce and spending on anything SNAP eligible was not allowed. And it makes me concerned that the federal government and California and Massachusetts for that matter are could be diverging in terms of what are acceptable program designs in a way that would undercut both efforts. Um, so California is investing millions of dollars right now to do the EBT integration. Um, and I think that program design is likely the one the state's gonna support going forward because the SNAP agency here strongly preferred it as well. So wanted to raise that for you and, and hopefully maybe have some follow-up conversations to make sure that California and Massachusetts and the USDA don't start going down different paths that make it difficult to expand these programs in ways that are technically 
I think, easier. And many would argue, you know, like a, a proven way to improve nutrition while also giving flexibility to CalFresh families to spend the money easily. Okay, thanks for flagging that and I'll uh, make sure that the region's keeping a list of issues that seem technical and important to deal with offline. So I'll, uh, I'll check back with them on this one. Great, and I'll follow up with you by email. Thanks so much. Okanubi, Laura, you're next. Yeah, thank you. My name is Laura. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Ceci Dean. <laughs> that's who you, but that's what you are, an ambassador for hope for all of us. Uh, I'm going to piggyback uh, pretty much did on what somebody already said. My concern, uh, I work with uh, adults with developmental disability at an uh, adult daycare setting. And, you know, uh, even before the COVID, we are encouraged to limit classroom instruction to now be in the community. So, which makes it difficult to be able to meet the congregate setting meal requirement for CACFP. So I'm also advocating for flexibility. I don't know if we should transition to grab and go or what else is available to us, but you know, I think that you know, uh, the CACFP personnel need to be educated on all of these competing requirements so that we, we continue to promote this great uh, opportunity for, you know, to close the disparity when it comes to meal and, and uh, you know, uh, promote mutual learning, whatever mm -hmm. setting people de decide. Because I, I'm sure that all the farmers, or all the people pro providing the food, they want to minimize or reduce waste as well. If, if a lot of people don't have access to the food, then some of the goals of this program will be defeated, particularly for people that have developmental disability. Sometimes this CACFP is the only nutritious meal that they get. They can eat, you know, mac and cheese five times a day, wherever else, but to balance it with fruits and vegetables, this is the only setting. And we evidence-based says that this has been prolonging their life. So it's a great program that we don't want to lose. So please, we need, we need a, a, a waiver. This waiver needs to be perpetual. For those who requested, we should be granted that continued flexibility. Uh, as we're trying to get back in the community, everybody's not gonna come back to the center the same way. So, and to minimize, and I mean, health and safety is also a major consideration. We wanna be in different parts without huge congregation, but six people at the park, six people at the museum, six people at you know different play library, but they will still be eating together like a family, but we, we don't wanna be in a classroom setting uh, going forward. Um, at the same time, we don't wanna lose this privilege of, of a nutritious meal. So please help. Well, thank you for that. And it sounds like you run a great program. So um, thank you for that as well. I, I So I guess I, I can, I'll, I'll uh, talk with the region offline about the request, but I do thank you for flagging CACFP finally. I saw that there were a couple of comments in the chat as well. And CACFP uh, doesn't, isn't, uh, uh, doesn't always get the show stop stopper attention that uh, WIC or SNAP or school meals have of late, but it's a wonderful program. Uh, it's often, it doesn't, it doesn't always get um, the call out that I think it deserves. And it's definitely an area of focus and attention for us for a couple of reasons. One is we know we can update the standards uh, to continue the great work on um, uh, lifting up quality nutrition. Second is the Biden administration has called for significant advance uh, expansion in childcare. And we know that CACFP will ride along with that. And we wanna think a lot about uh, how, how are there opportunities to grow those two programs together? And does this a moment or for opportunity to reconsider some of the requirements or uh, issues in CACFP? So just letting you know, we're thinking quite a bit about it there. And CACFP is also a program that we, uh, that team stepped forward uh, under the president's executive order asking agencies to take a look at equity uh, uh, within each program and, and CACFP uh, stood up within USDA and said, hey, we'd like to do have an equity assessment done 
many of our providers are people of color, many of the kids we serve are people of color, what, how are we doing from an equity front, um, right? We don't wanna just take for granted uh, that we are, um, that, uh, that we're doing okay there given who we serve. And so uh, anyway, just wanna let you know and others on the, on the platform that it's a program that I, I, I do spend quite a bit of time on and I think we have a lot of uh, things to grow and change uh, and strengthen there uh, with what's already a terrific program. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Vanessa Tehran. Well, hi, thank you so much um, for the opportunity for us to be here. Um, my name is Vanessa Teran. I'm a policy and communications associate with the Mixteco Indígena Community Organizing Project, a nonprofit that serves indigenous communities in the central coast of California. And um, during the pandemic, I think that one of the one of the greatest opportunities that we learned about is what does um, food justice mean? What does nutrition mean? And how do we apply um, being able to you know, provide this service to our, our communities. Um, and I just want to share that through, though our community is very appreciative of the food that's given to our, our children on site, um, what we saw during the pandemic, during the grab and go was first, you know, was delivered day to day. So you, our children and families had to pick up food day to day, but then it turned into a weekly pickup. So you could go in at the end of the week and pick up or the beginning of the week and pick up food for the week. Um, you, the the interesting part is that once it became you know the pandemic EBT was given and the cards were given, um, we saw a lot more families being able to have, you know the authority or you know the 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 ability to purchase food that's culturally relevant to our communities. We work you know I think especially when we talk about Black Indigenous people of color that we really need to transform what nutrition means that's adaptable. Um, to our communities that better serves, you know, what does a healthy meal mean um, for us? Um, I have nieces and nephews myself, you know, I'm able to see a lot of our community members with their food. And I was able to witness what food my niece and nephew brought home. And I was starting to see that a lot of the food was high in sugar, high in cholesterol, very um, inappropriate food that, you know, was in the form um, constituted as healthy food or nutrition food or sufficient food. But when I asked parents um, is that it, it wasn't really food that our community was eating. Um, and a lot of it was waste, wasted, not all of it, but a lot of it. And so here is a moment in time that we can really consider uh, would, how would we reframe nutrition and food programs in the future? Um, there's models, you know, across different agents, different schools, where there's a farm to table, uh, where there's, you know, what would it look like for schools to really provide nutritious meals where it teaches our families and children how to create and prepare their healthy meals as opposed to just grabbing a, a, a meal, um, but that this is really a time to rechannel, you know, some of those monies into things that could really um, provide appropriate food for our communities, um, as opposed to it being designed by someone else and being a cookie cutter meal for everyone else. Um, so just wanted to reflect that and see um, from our community that pandemic EBT or the EBT card really became instrumental in being able to provide, um, buy, you know, beans and rice and a lot of the foods that we 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 eat and, and that sustain us. And so thank you again for allowing me to provide public comment. No, I really appreciate that. And I think you said it so well, right? Empowering families to um, purchase what's most appropriate for them and their, their cultural and personal interpretation of uh, uh, the healthy dietary guidelines. I, I just wanna reflect on one thing or maybe two quick things is um, when I took this job and I sat down with a group within FNS, the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, uh, they're the group that interpret the dietary guidelines, um, uh, interpret the National Academy recommendations into the guidelines, and they also help work with the programs on what the standards should be. And I, I, was, one, I was sort of concerned that uh, as coming in that I might have to, it would be a sensitive subject for me to say, hey, it does feel like historically a lot of the advice or the guidance given in the nutrition education space, which they are expert on, is oriented around a cultural, uh, a single cultural orientation to food, right? To food preparation. And they brought it up to me and so, sort of said, this is uh, just a, an area they're ex extremely 
uh, energized about, which is to make sure that the advice that we're offering, the, um, the expectations that we set for the program build in much more diversity and that uh, for even the reevaluation that we're doing of SNAP's basic benefit around what should the thrifty food plan be and what are the food baskets, even as we talk about that today, uh, they are saying, okay, we looked at the food baskets out according to potentially four different cultural menus and whether uh, right, different people from uh, different cultural orientation with respect to food could make the make it work. So that's what I just want to let you know that's happening, but we have a lot more to do. We have some history to overcome and uh, your comments really resonate with me. Thank you. Thank you again. Barbara Gates, you're next. Well, that was so quick. Thank you so much. Hi, yeah. Um, really uh, privileged to be here. I'm the founding director of a local nonprofit organization in Northern San Diego called Lean and Green Kids. We work with educators in school nutrition to improve child nutrition through plant-based meals, uh, specifically featuring healthful, affordable, and culturally relevant legumes for protein. And I just, after the last comment and uh, reflections, I just would encourage people to check out our website. We have nine lessons, multicultural, eco-focused nutrition lessons. And we're really trying to change um, the narrative on nutrition to be more inclusive and eco-focused. So with that, um, I want to ask, in order to combat diet-related disease and climate change, both of which um, impact people of color disproportionately, how will the USDA provide and promote more plant-based meals with legumes and support school staff um, and nutritionists in the public health space in serving and promoting these meals? Thank you. Well, I guess I'll step back and say, I think we are trying to think even a little bit more broadly, which is climate friendly. Uh, Plant-based certainly is a, a piece of that, but not the only uh, not the only part of it, right? How we procure, how we work with states, and sorry, and support states in their procurement, um, and think about the the process uh, for that by which the food is um, created, uh, delivered, and even what it's served on, right? These are all a broad set of issues that I think uh, we and states and districts are a conversation we're all anxious to have with each other. Um, so there are any number of ways to go. One I flagged earlier was we are proposing a um, healthy incentives uh, uh, fund where districts could potentially receive startup costs or ongoing enhanced reimbursement uh, for healthy practices. And one might, one might for example, be integrating uh, more uh, plant-based options. Like that's a, for example, Congress obviously will uh, ultimately decide. But uh, I think it's an area where we're looking for suggestions. Uh, Friends of the Earth have sent us a lot of ideas around plant-based and would certainly welcome any thoughts that you have. Thanks. Valerie Morshik, you're next. And Valerie, it looks like you're using an older version of Zoom, so I'm going to promote you to a panelist so you'll be able to speak. Sorry about that. Um, so I love all the details that people are giving regarding specific programs and upgrades that they think that could be. Um, implemented, but I kind of wanted to zoom out to the bigger picture. I think this pandemic has shown us how fragile our food system is, especially our supply chains, and also kind of, you know, just the new threats that are on the horizon with the JBS uh, cyber attack. And so I was just wondering, like, where is the USDA going with this? I think of you as kind of like the protectors of our food system. So I would love to hear more about that. And what we can do to help advocate for that space. Well, thanks. I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, uh, there are the USDA actually has in the last two weeks put out three announcements on using some of the funds made available through the American Rescue Fund to 
make um, investments that are responsive to the needs in the supply chain uh, amongst producers, processors, and others specific to pandemic, but with an eye towards what are smart investments on um, food systems. So the secretary has actually genuinely challenged us to transform the food system. Each of us has a piece and a part in it. That's a small thing. We don't plan to do it by next week, but uh, each of the mission areas is actually working together uh, towards uh, just basically a more resilient, more equitable uh, food system that results in healthier food, uh, right? Uh, so that there's more access to healthy food and that we think a lot about um, where the food comes from, how it gets to us and what the actual ultimate uh, food is. So we've done investments around, for example, in investing in the emergency food system, shoring that up with food purchases, but it's not just about the food purchases. Part of it is how are we doing the food purchases? So we'll do it some in through some of our traditional means, but we're also gonna be working with states, likely state secretaries of agriculture, or other state leaders to have them be procuring locally, right? To supply that, because we know that we need to build out uh, that procurement. If you wanna build local, we can't drive all local purchasing, right? We're just, we're sitting in the wrong chair. So that's an example of we'll learn together with states about what to do there. And hopefully we'll learn something about how to move forward in the future. There are other investments on uh, looking at, I think, um, meat processing, right? Highly concentrated industry, easy for disruption. You mentioned one example of disruption. So there's some plans there as well. So there's a lot, there's a lot on our website. Um, and a critical part of that, of, that it shows up both in that space, but also in our equity work is, uh, finding ways to bring BIPOC farmers, um, uh, making sure that they are having opportunities uh, with you at doing USDA business, right? That we are serving um, a full and diverse set of producers. So I, I feel like it's all we think about, right? Is ever, so I'm over here in the sort of food, food security, food assistance, health space, but it also intersects with um, how we do the work in the food system. So very much trying to think in both. Both fronts. So that's a little vague, but I think you'll find uh, the announcements recently made on our site really rich with a lot of information and a lot more is going to be coming out uh, throughout the summer as these concepts make their way into specific grant or investment opportunities. So thanks for your question. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Valerie. And next we have Gail Hawkster. Gail, if you can hear me, we can't hear you. Okay, thank you. There we go. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and, and to uh, share. I represent County of Riverside in California, the second largest WIC agency in the state. And I just want to say one of the things that maybe my passion is, and I've been with WIC many years, is that we really do a lot of health equity work. We're in the communities. Our clinics are in their neighborhoods. We service a large number of, of community um, residents that are represent health equity. But many times WIC isn't looked at for maybe the CDC grants and many of the money that's coming through. WIC isn't in the picture. And how can we change that? Because I think WIC is a very influential partner. Usually we're at the door that they walk through that ends up providing resources as well as food, as well as education, addressing ACEs, all of the different trauma-informed events. But WIC is not usually at the table. And how can, and maybe I'm talking from more of a national standpoint, but how can WIC be more seen as a real valued player when we're seeing funding coming out at a national level on health equity? So that's well, my question. Uh, well, I'm glad it's a question and a comment, I think, and I'm glad you raised it. So it's a different variation on uh, a theme that we've been talking about, but so it really resonates is um, one of the ways that we're thinking about WIC and these new investments of funds is it's a top priority of the administration to address uh, disparity in maternal mortality, right? The, um, the alarmingly high rates of maternal mortality, but also the disparate rates based on race and ethnicity. 
so, and seeing WIC as a key player there. But when you dig down into that, right, it is the disconnect that you're talking about, how to more fundamentally embed WIC in uh, maternal health healthcare, uh, as well as I think, uh, in, you know, uh, infant and toddler care. So we're spending time with our colleagues at HHS uh, having this conversation um, to how do we make this a two-way, um, uh, you know, that's one thing for us to be talking about, but it, right, right, what you're talking about is this connection at the local level. So it's top of mind, and if you have thoughts or suggestions, very much welcome them. Um, uh, I don't have the answer, but I, I'm familiar with the concern. Thank you. And I have been involved in health equity work with Robert Wood Johnson. So I would, you might hear from me. That would be wonderful. Good. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Gail. And Catherine Safford, you are next. Hi. Sorry, I just unmuted myself. Okay. I'm Catherine Safford, and I'm with Coco Kids, and we're a sponsor of. Um, CACFP for family childcare homes. And so I just wanted to um, say a few things. First of all, thank you for USDA for all the flexibilities that have been provided um, throughout this year. It's made a huge difference and um, is really making a difference for our providers. Um, two of the waivers that um, have really risen to the top for us, I just wanted to share about are um, the virtual visits, um, our specialists are doing virtual visits now and it's really working. It's working well for uh, the providers as well as the specialists. So they um, get a good picture of what's going on without being so interruptive by showing up and having the children, you know, responding different ways. So that, that's one thing that's working well. And I feel like um, how much driving around because we have two large counties, it's an incredible amount of, of mileage on the road that's being taken off the plate, which is amazing and uh, good for the environment. And secondly, I wanted to just mention the tier one for all for a year and how amazing and important this is for our providers. Um, I would like to see that the tearing taken away um, permanently. Um, it's not that, um, I mean, I feel like all providers, we want all providers to serve all children healthy meals and childcare and having it um, bifurcated that way has really put a damper on how many participants we get and how many um, people in the tier two areas are just frustrated with the difference and less likely to participate when at the same time they're not, um, providers doing childcare aren't getting rich. Um, the cost of food is very expensive in California and it just seems unfair to them. And so if that were a, that is a barrier to participation and I would love to see that removed permanently. And thank you. Thank you. And both of those things I've heard from the CACFP community and the CACFP national staff. So um, it sounds like it's something, a commonly held perspective on, a, on a, a good thing and a thing you struggle with, so thanks. Thanks, Catherine. And Karen Farley, you are next. For letting me comment. Um, I just want, I'm with the California WIC Association and I just appreciate all the ideas that have been shared in the chat today and um, the dialogue with you. And I just wanted to underscore some foundational things that we're looking for. And that is, it's a new day and all of these programs, none of these programs individually can lift anybody out of poverty in most cases. So it's a new day and we have to think about everything we do and how in all planning and how these programs can work together. And there's a lot of, when you get to the user experience, there's a lot of confusion and complexity when you're trying to use multiple programs. So when we're thinking about opportunities to change things up and get participation, no matter what the program, um, how can we do that as a team and collaboratively working on addressing poverty. Um, 
And some of that is the user experience and thinking about the hassle and value in every transaction somebody has to make and the cultural and ethnic inclusivity is also foundational. And then third point being, um, I think it's time to look outside of WIC um, and how are other large businesses, if we think about, or outside of USDA, if we think of large, if you think of USDA as a business, how is healthcare and business functioning? And you know, integrating in healthcare, um, uh, WIC, WIC and these, some of these other programs could probably even be more integrated into healthcare or other social service programs. How are we sharing data and what is the user experience in that? Um, so working collaboratively, the user experience and um, looking outside our silo for other modern ways to do business were three foundations that I think could underscore all the specific ideas that we can come up with, all of which are badly needed. So thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I appreciate that. Um, you know, we, uh, I think the, so this president has been very active on executive orders. Uh, um, actually, um, someone has to read and act under all of them could take a pause but uh, uh one of we got an executive order within the first few weeks on um benefit coordination uh actually there are maybe two on that front so just to let you know that that is a uh, core tenant is delivery and we actually have um one of the first uh policy officials that started with me on day one in fns is a uh, director of delivery so and we're going to be building out that team because uh, we need to be thinking about sort of right, uh, as you were saying, the end user at the end of the day, how does how are people in need uh, easily and seamlessly connected to our services? Sometimes it's by directly coming to the programs, but it can also be that they're coming through another doorway. Uh, and the other thing you said that I think is very um, uh, resonated a lot with me is the Secretary Vilsack is constantly talking about how we're really a Department of Health. Uh, we now, you know, you all have known for a long time, but I think there's a growing awareness in the, in the country that nutrition is just a core driver of uh, health outcomes. Um, and uh, he sees that uh, as a key reason why we have to take on the food systems work as well as the, uh, he, he instructed me right when I started is this is not just about food insecurity, but nutrition security. So it's kind of a bedrock um uh value for him uh and and us as well so thanks i think there's a lot of synergy there great thanks karen and derek you are next great can you hear me yes perfect well, thank you so much for your time today, Stacy. Um, I am with the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank, and I wanted to comment on the current SFSP waivers we have through uh, next year. Our food bank has um, helped sponsor over 58 sites here in LA County, uh, and we very much appreciate that those waivers were extended into the next year. I am curious um, whether we will see any sort of movement to make those uh, waivers permanent. I know before the pandemic happened, uh, there was a proposed rule, uh, the streamlining program requirements and improving integrity in the summer service food pro summer food service program uh, that was proposed, uh, but of course derailed. So I'm curious if there's going to be any similar proposed rule after um, into next year, uh, or just whether USDA uh, is looking into uh, just extending those waivers further in other ways. Um, just, you know, acknowledging that uh, hopefully we'll see uh, the expansion of summer EBT, but of course also acknowledging that it's um, not an either or, um, but a, a, a yes and. So again, thank you. Thanks, Derek. So I think your expertise in this particular area, uh, like many on this call, is uh, and but your question might be uh, exceeding my 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 specifics. So let me answer more globally, unless Jesus, uh, you have a better answer here. So the my, our authority, the secretary's authority to do things um, 
that were new and innovative that were, were offered under the family's first uh, authority expires uh, in a couple of weeks. So we put out the waivers that would be available right in response to the pandemic. And that was all tied to the pandemic. So those, uh, unless there's a change in law, I think we lose our authority. Now, but of course we have other authorities, right, to pursue uh, different things. So for example, are there ways to make uh, it easier to combine programs, um, streamline uh, summer, and then of course there's uh, considering new legal authorities. So I'm not sure the specific answer to your question because I'm not sure which category it falls. It seems like you've referenced a couple of things in which they fall under. But yeah, back to where you ended. Um, I, I, I always heard, I always come more out of the SNAP advocacy space. And I gotta tell you, I always heard that uh, summer or the child nutrition programs were complicated, but boy, I'm really, that's, I'm starting to uh, uh, appreciate it more and more. And I, I think whatever we can do to make it easier to package and deliver these programs for the both end, as you just described. I mean, uh, certainly folks like yourself who do the extraordinary work of trying to post up these programs and run them, we don't wanna make it hard. So uh, our problem is just whether, I think it's mostly legal authority. So child nutrition reauthorization is happening right now and it's a really great time for us to try to work with Congress to see where we can untangle this knot a little bit to make it easier for uh, great organizations like yours to feed kids, because that's the goal. So sorry to not be, I. I uh, uh, perhaps the region can follow up with you on the specifics of what your question. Thanks, Derek. And I just want to invite others to provide comment. Um, we currently have uh, one person in, denying, in line, Denise, um, you'll be next. And then just a reminder for those who are joining by phone, if you would like to join, you can dial star nine if joining by phone, and that will place you in the queue for public comment. And Denise, you can go ahead and speak. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the USDA wonderful support for the WIC program. I'm Denise G with the PHFE WIC program in Southern California in Los Angeles. And you know, USDA really had this wonderful foresight of actually encouraging or requiring the WIC programs to move from the paper checks to um, electronic benefits and how wonderfully timely that was. Uh, so along with that, I wanted to just thank you for the flexibilities. Along with all those that have mentioned it previously, I too would like to request for the waivers to continue, but the, specifically, I would love for us to have the separation of duties requirement removed and mm. the presence of CERT kept in place. Those have really helped us ease the process with enrolling families and helping them in that recertification process without compromising the program. We've been able to actually successfully run these procedures remotely um, and it has gone well. We've connected well with families. So if USDA could really consider that. One other um, consideration that I would like for us to um, consider for the WIC program modeled after the SNAP program is telephonic signatures for the WIC program. I think that that would be a wonderful addition. It's been successfully done by SNAP. So it seems like it should be something we could definitely adopt and learn from them. So that could also be up for consideration. Thank you. So Denise, can you, uh, thank you, first of all, great ideas. Can you talk a little bit more about how, why separation of duty has been successful? Just curious to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, with separation of duty, so at the P at PHFE WIC program, I am also the program integrity um, deputy director. So we are definitely um, keen to making certain there is integrity, there is no abuse, no fraud. And with separation of duties, it, while some agencies may choose to adopt it, I think that that should be an option if they feel that that should um, be procedures they would like to keep in place. But for many who, like our agency, we have other ways in which to um, ensure that there is still integrity and quality. Right now, especially if we were to continue with remotely serving families, it is clunky to move from one person to the next person. Um, 
while maintaining a real high level of customer service and engagement. Uh, that really hasn't actually been quite uh, figured out because thank, thank you, you have allowed us to have this separation of duties waiver that supported us to be able to um, complete a certification. But it really isn't quite necessary with all the other um, features in place when we um, issue benefits through the card, we have in the system a recording of who is taking that action. Uh, we also have a recording of who was the one who processed the recertification, who asked these questions, who collected that, who calculated the income to ensure that they were um, income eligible. So with these uh, robust, robust uh, WIC computer features, there isn't really that necessary additional step of doing this handover to the next individual, not to mention, not, not that we incur, we definitely discourage it, but there are some oh, of smart folks that should they want to, separation of duties isn't going to be the preventative measure to avoid any abuse. So instead, what ends up happening is it becomes a hardship to be able to um, provide services. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, and when technology or um, just advances in how we deliver service overcome our rules, right, it's important to be aware of that. I, I'm a little mindful of my own limitation on that front in the sense of I'm, you know, I'm not keeping track of every advancement in technology. And it was, it, uh, I'll just tee out unless there, if there are no questions queued, I will give an anecdote, which is that uh, early on in my tenure in this job, uh, I believe I was at, I, so, I, someone asked, uh, we, there were, the, my peers and I were at a meeting at USDA and we were asked, hey, is there a way that you all can um, promote healthcare.gov? Like the Biden administration wants to make sure people know they do a special enrollment period, folks can sign up for health coverage, really important during COVID. So of course we want to do that. And I, I raised my hand, you know, knew, don't, don't know these people. And I said, hey, it's great. You know, do you guys have um, some content that you could share with us? Like, you know, shareables or um, something that we, you know, links so that we, if we're going to promote healthcare.gov, we know where we're sending people to, right? You want to, you don't want to just say like, check out health. You want to give people good stuff and can HHS or the White House give me something that I can use? And another woman raised her hand and said, well, I'm sure we have PDFs that we could, you know, send to you. Uh, we could take the like healthcare.gov fact sheet and PDF it and then send it over to you. And I thought, okay, we're having two totally different conversations. <laughs> like she doesn't know what a shareable is. She doesn't know that I want to send people to a, a you know, do a warm handoff to a real link. And I, and I thought, and if my first reaction was to, you know, oh, wow. <laughs> and then my second was, how many conversations am I in where I'm that person <laughs> saying, oh, well, this is how we have to do it, completely unaware that there's a better way. So thank you, Denise, for raising that. Uh, and please keep doing that. And if you get a, a blank stare coming at you from USDA, persevere. We, uh, we, you know, I'm sure the world is moving a lot faster than government is. So we need to be made aware of when things can change. Thank you so much for being so open to hearing our comments. Appreciate it very much. And I don't see any more um, hands raised in the queue, but I, I do. we do have Stacey for a few more minutes. So I do want to encourage folks, if you have thoughts, ideas, or concerns to share, please do submit them via the chat box or raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you're joining by phone. And Stacey, I also wanted to make sure um, that since we have the time, we might read some of the great written comments that are coming in, um, in part so that all the folks who are joining us um, through Spanish trans interpretation can also um, get the benefit of hearing some of these comments as well. So I'm gonna share one from Sarah Diaz. Um, she says, I know this is on your radar, but I'd also just like to reiterate that online shopping is a, is a must. During the pandemic, it was a huge issue, of course, because families had to increase their exposures or even break quarantine to get their WIC foods. Some families made the difficult decision to go without their WIC foods in order to keep their families safer. Even during non-pandemic times though, trans transportation is often a huge barrier for WIC families. Now that they can use SNAP online, they're wondering why WIC doesn't have the same capability. It should, <laughs> so they're exactly right on. Um, 
we just move a little bit more slowly in government. And of course, our states are uh, critical partners here. So, I mean, Jesus, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think SNAP online shopping is, I think it went, I'm not sure. I think, now, I think um, it, just, it went from like being almost zero, right? To, I think it was like 1%. And now maybe 4% of SNAP purchases. Like that's pretty extraordinary that it went up that rapidly. So clearly there's a demand for it. Uh, and we don't, you know, we have over 200, we have about 250,000 stores in SNAP nationally and only a very small number of them are offering online shopping. So the fact that it bolted up that dramatically was both a function of COVID, but clearly a huge desire to be able to have more choices um, in terms of online uh, and online shopping being a critical way to achieve that. So. We absolutely want to do more in SNAP, uh, and right, and uh, I'm glad uh, there is as I see you. So part of that is stores need to come to us and tell us that, you know, they want to do it. And so big grocery chains are incredibly sophisticated, right? All these big grocery chains are offering online. It's not, and it's not really shopping because shopping that SNAP participants have always been able to do, it's payment, right? It's online payment. That's the, the rub. Um, so those big stores, like once we put up, here's the security and operational protocols for how to do it, you know, a Albertsons or a Safeway can look at that and say, hey, we're going to make a decision, business decision about coming on or not coming on. And they have all kinds of business decisions to make about taking Apple Pay or, you know, whatever else change they want to make on their payment. So we hope they come on quickly, but that they, it's, it's really the ball is a little bit in their court. Where we're trying to emphasize, focus our energy on the SNAP side is thinking how do we support those smaller stores, smaller regional individual community stores who, them, who may not even have an online purchasing platform for non-SNAP participants, right? So, and we're thinking about farmers markets and how do we use our resources to bring in other, um, stores who, need, who really need our help. So that's one set. And then of course, WIC, right? Like how do we uh, expand this great innovation to WIC? So luckily we have some money. Um, this WIC, uh, this new WIC 390 fund as we're calling it from the rescue fund. And so part of our efforts there uh, will be to see if we can accelerate that. But um, yeah, what a wonderful, this, that was an example of something that I, I think we will, FNS was proceeding with extremely cautiously, understandably, because the security of benefits is really critical, but it sort of got turbocharged and we want to keep going. Um, Thank you for that, Stacey. So I don't see any other um, questions or comments in the queue. And I know we're, we're creeping up on our 1.30 deadline. So I am going to just take this opportunity to say um, to everyone who joined today, to, to everyone who attended, thank you so much for being here, for everyone who shared their insights, their expertise, their experiences. It, it is much appreciated. Um, thank you very much, Stacey, for you being here and hearing all of this. We know that you were going to take this with you um, and have it influence your choices and the choices of other decision makers in DC. And we really appreciate your openness to being here with all the folks in California and hearing what we have to say. Um, also wanna appreciate um, the folks in the Western region who joined us, Jesus and your team. We're looking forward to continued engagement with you all as well. Um, as a reminder, we are going to be sharing a recording of this session. So if you registered for this event, you should be receiving that. We'll also post it on the Nourish California website. Um, and you can expect that the Nourish California team and likely many of our partners are going to be sharing upcoming opportunities for everyone to engage in policy action um, on upcoming federal policies that are going to be affecting WIC and the Child Nutrition Program. So please keep an eye out for those. Um, and a, a, a last thank you to everyone for being here. You are all much appreciated, um, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks, Tia. Bye.